announce uh, our first speaker today, today, Hans Zwart from the University of Twente in the Netherlands, and he's going to speak about the inverse generator problem. Please. Yeah, thank you, Johan. Thank you, Ivan. Uh, nice to nice to talk here, even if it's only virtual and online. Yeah, but it's uh, and it's also nice to talk about this whole problem. Yeah, because I've been uh, I've been working on it. So I will introduce the problem, and then we will see uh, what we get. Um, so the, the the question is the following. Yeah. So you have an operator A, and which is the infinitesimal generator of a strongly continuous semigroup. And then the question is if the same holds for the inverse. Now, then you only need uh, a few seconds to think that this question is basically, okay, the answer is no, because basically you could have, of course, a, a semi-group where the spectrum does like this. It concentrates at, at, uh, at zero from the positive side. And of course, if I then take the inverse, then the spectrum runs to plus infinity. So then look at the spectrum. So that is just then what it says. And the answer is no, because I have not even assumed then that A, uh, A uh, inverse exists. Yeah. So it could also be in that A was, for instance, the zero operator. And then this question is nonsense. So you have to formulate the question a little bit better. So we change into the question, and so not to have something like that with the spectrum, we change the question, and we assume that the, uh, A generates a bounded C0 semigroup, and that A inverse exists as a closed and densely defined operator. So we make basically the question in such a way that it has meaning, yeah? Um, so this is then the, the question. So the, you have a uh, generator of a bounded, strongly continuous semi-group on a Banach space and that uh, an A inverse exists as a closed and densely defined operator. And then the question is, is the A inverse also the generator of a semi-group? Now, this question dates back a long time. It, uh, it was first posed by the Lauwenfels in 88. So that's already uh, more than 30 years ago. Um, it was also uh, in, in a good journal, and, but the question got no attention. When I found this uh, article back, I traced uh, who was referring to this article, and you can do that now very easily. Nobody was referring to this article, not on, on this, probably on, on something else, but not on this question. So he really posed it as an open question, and um, but nobody thought it was interested at that time. I uh, may be good to mind that basically the question, the answer was already given earlier. We will come back to it uh, later. That was also completely. So this question was really clearly stated in the Lauwenfels in this paper in 88. And he also proved uh, that this question had a positive answer in one, one uh, special case. And I will go into it. Uh, before I do that, it, it's very easy to convince yourself that this question is true for mat matrices, of course. Yeah? So for matrices, it's true. So that that is then okay. Then the then the easy thing is to extend it to operators. So let's go to this his positive result. And then we assume that a generates a bounded analytic semi-group on the Banach space X. So you have uh, A generates a sectorially bounded analytic semi-group on X. And you know from the, the, the theorem on, on say analytic holomorphic semi-group that that is equivalent that the resolvent estimates and holds, holds uh, for this. So that basically, so the, let's make a very small drawing. So the semi-group is bounded in this region. And then the, the, the resolvent has this uh, estimate in this region. Yeah, that's then the, that's the, and they, they are equivalent. So you find it, and this is the same theta if I have here in the blue, this was the theta. Okay. 
So the nice thing is, if you have this characterization, you only have to look at the resolvent of your operator and to see what kind of estimate it satisfies. And then, okay, A inverse exists, and, after, and you just do some simple algebra. Yeah, You relate the resolvent of A inverse with the resolvent of A. And it's basically here you see the spectral mapping theorem, Yeah, that the resolvent of A goes into the one over of the resolvent of A inverse. But you uh, just have this uh, just this equality, and then you apply the norm estimate. So you estimate the norm of this operator of the resolvent of A inverse. It's still visible. And then you just do the first one you estimate, the second one, this one, you find it here. You have your assumption that A generates an analytic semi-group. So you can use that. And of course you have then the, uh, here you have the S inverse. So here you get the S inverse that bound and you get this. So you get very easily that A inverse satisfies a similar estimate as A. Of course you have to be a little bit careful with the argument. We still have to check the argument condition. Yeah, but you see and that for A and for A inverse, we have a similar argument, or we have a similar resolvent estimate. I should say it correctly. Now you go to the next page and you see, so we have this for all S, so that the argument of S inverse is this, we have this, but now the argument of S inverse is the same as the argument of S. And so you see by just this, this theorem, that A inverse generates a sectorial bounded analytic semigroup on X. So this is a positive result for analytic semigroup. The proof that Le Le Lauenfeld gave was a different one. Yeah, so this is, this is the short proof as we know it now. But you see huh, that this is a nice positive result. You have for analytic semigroups, you, it's not even hard to prove it. But you see, we get a little bit more. We said we asked A inverse to be an infinitesimal generator of a C0 semigroup, but we got automatically that it was a bounded semigroup. So we got the boundedness of this uh, semigroup basically for free. And that turns out to be no coincidence what I also wrote down yesterday. And so we, we come to two questions. So I formulate now uh, two questions. So A is an infinitesimal generator of a bounded C0 semigroup on an A inverse exists. And then I have my first question is A inverse, the infinitesimal generator of the C0 semigroup on X. And the second question is, I. Can I also assume that it's bounded? Now, if you think about this and for, for matrices again, if you have a matrix such that the exponential is bounded, yeah, then you see that the inverse, you always look at the eigenvalues for matrices, you can easily look at the eigenvalue. You see that that is also true. Yeah, it cannot have multiplicity two suddenly on the imaginary axis if the, if the A matrix did not have it. And it turns out to be somehow true in, in general to be. So this is the theorem and I will go with. So if the answer to the question, if A inverse is the, so the inverse generator question is true for all A's, for all generators and for all Banach spaces, then the answer to the boundedness question is, is yes as well. So, but it's important that, so there could be special cases where it's different, but if you, if you want, let's say this question holds. So the, the answer to the question of, of the inverse generator question is true for all generators A and for all Banach spaces X, then you get the boundedness for free. Yeah, it's clear and that if you have a bounded, then it's definitely a C0 semigroup. So the QB, question is, is stronger. And let, uh, 
Let's show how this proof goes. Now, so you let TT be a bounded semigroup generated by A. There you start and let ST be the C0 semigroup generated by A inverse. And that one, we know that it exists because we have said that our uh, first question, though the Q, we assume that Q is yes. Yeah? The answer to Q is positive. So what the only thing that re has to be remain to show is that the ST is bounded. Yeah, so we get, uh, so that's, so we have a semi-group and we have to show that it is bounded. How do we proceed? Now, we build a bigger space because we have assumed that the question Q is true for every A and for every Banach space. So I build a bigger space. So we build a bigger space by taking L, L2, so N uh, countable copies of the Banach space X. And the norm, we just take the, say, the, the L2 induced norm. We just take this norm. Now we have to, and on, on this big space, we now build a big operator, which is just building out of diagonal of A. So if you, if you see it, it is the A, and then the A divided by two, and then A divided by three, et cetera, et cetera. So this I built on, the, on my big space. Then it's not hard to say that the, that the, that the semi-group, because I just use scaled versions of E is just TT, TT divided by two, TT divided by three. That's just good. Similarly, you can calculate the A extended inverse. And of course that is just then you, you flip everything, you flip the one over N and you flip the A. So you get the N times A inverse. And now you look at what is the semi-group then doing. Yeah, wait one moment, it just goes faster. So that will be the diagonal. So that will be ST, S2T, etc. Now, it's not hard to show that the norm on my extended space, so this is my extended space, and of a diagonal mm -hmm. operator is just the supremum of all the diagonal elements. Yeah, so the norm on the extended, so if I have say an operator Q1, Q2, etc., here mm -hmm. on my extended states, uh, on my extended space, this one, then the norm of this extended Q is just the maximum or the supremum of all the QN norms. So I get this one. So I have, based on that, I have this, this relation here. So what did we have to prove? We have to prove that the supremum of group ST was bounded, yeah? Because I want to show that this is a bounded semi-group. So what do I do? I split the time, zero infinity, I split it into uh, zero, one, one, two, uh, et cetera. And you see that this holds. I can split it in every time I get this. Uh, and then you see here, you recognize that that is precisely the supremum, that that is precisely my norm of my extended uh, semi-group. But wait one moment, now I just have a semi-group and I take the supremum over an interval zero one. And of course that is always bounded because I have a zero zero semi-group, which is always bounded on a compact interval. So by doing this trick, that is just a kind of harmonica thing of, of doing it, you see that I get my boundedness. So I get my boundedness for free. So that was the first result. It is also a remark that if X was a Hilbert space, then this extended state space was also a Hilbert space. 
Yeah, so I, 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 I keep, if, if I would only ask this question for a Hilbert space, I would keep, I, my proof would keep, uh, would stay completely in the language of Hilbert spaces. Okay. Now, as I said, I hope it's, it's visible, but now we get, now we are, now we get to the thing to answer the question is the, of the inverse generator for uh, uh, um, an, a Banach space. So now we will get to the question. Is this readable? If I can make it a little bit smaller, I can do it like this, but then I don't have it. Yes, it is readable. Okay, I will do it. I will, I will stay like this then. Um, because for me, it's not readable. There are all kinds, but I know what, what I wrote. So that's not so important. Um, so what, what was, I, I had this thought some time ago. And I, and I realized that, say, the, the resolvents were just integral transforms of the semi-group. Yeah, we all know this formula. This is in what you learned in a four, first course on, on C0 semi-groups. You have in that the resolvent to the power n is precisely this nice integral of the semi-group. And then is the question, hey, can we not get the same thing for something for, for this? For my in for the generator of the in uh, the inverse semigroup, and let's just assume that that the semigroup is exponentially stable. So then the inverse and then the the resolvent in zero exists, and the inverse is just a bounded operator. Yeah, just make life a little bit easier so that I can really talk about the exponential of this bounded operator. And then you think, wait one moment, of course. And this will not be for me. Yeah, um, the 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 um, exponential is just the sum of powers of resolvents with a pt. So if I then use the above formula, I use this in that, and I take all these kernels, all these kernels together, then I will get some function. And it turns out that that function is well known. And when I found it, I could do it in a different way as well. Yeah, but you have to do so. It's really so. This formula holds, and this is then this this j one is the Bessel function of the first kind and of the first order. Yeah, but you see, if you would just write this down with the above formula, that you would have a, a sum a, a, a sum of polynomials. Yeah, an infinite sum. And then you could ask yourself, okay, recognize this sum. And then that's a harder one, but okay. There were tricks to, to find it. But this is how you see. So you see now, and that, okay, I just have shown here exponentially stable so that I don't have to worry about, say, the a a integral. And I know that it exists. But you see there is an integral formula that transforms the semi-group into the inverse or the, the, the semi-group generated by the inverse. And now you have this formula, then you think, wait one moment, now I can do a lot. I have now really, it's not something that oh, here I have A and then by some miracle, I get into the semi-group generated by A inverse. Now I really have an integral formula. And here you can really, and now, okay. Now you ask yourself, okay, and now it already goes back to, I think, uh, yeah, the book of, of Phillips in, in there, Healing Phillips and they, they, uh, the books. You see, what do I assume here? What is my assumption basically here? It's just that it's bounded. I would like this to be bounded. So that means something that this then should somehow be an L1 kernel independent and with the norm independent of tau. If that would be the case, then you would have that this one would be uniformly bounded in, in, in tau. And then you look up uh, all the things which is known about Bessel functions and then you find out that that is not the case. So here we have the formula again. And now this is it. This, this function is not in L1. 
there you really have to look into to the theory on vessel functions and and then they say they say something about the asymptotic behavior and then you can prove that it's not in l1 and then you know already in, in hill and phillips calculus you really use somehow that you could have an integral transform with an uh, with an l1 kernel and then you not then you will have an unbounded operator so this gives rise to a counterexample, and I will show it here. So what you do, you, you look at the continuous functions, which are zero at one. So they are, so they live just on this interval and they are, they are nice, but they have to be zero there. And on that, you, you, you make the shift. So the shift is just then you move it all that way. That's just the shift. So, I don't know how many counter examples you have seen, but there are a lot of counter examples just, just using the shift. Yeah? The shift on, 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 on some weird spaces and you have again a counter example. So this is just not uh, something a weird space, just the continuous function zero and zero. You see you need zero at zero, otherwise this would not be a Z zero semigroup. And now you just apply the four, oh, no, let's see. That is it, yeah, here we go. Now you just plug in this semi-group, so you see you have an explicit expression now. You just put in this uh, x0 out of this space, and you just plug it in. And to, to keep it on one, uh, one uh, slide, I, I made already an integral substitution. Yeah, I changed already the t divided by, in t divided by tau. And now, since I'm, so this is my answer. And since I'm looking at the supremum norm, I can also look just at one point. If one point already blows up, then the supremum norm also blows up. So what do I do? I take this theta to be zero. So that already simplifies here, yeah? that simplifies the integral. And then I take my x zero, of course you are building a counter example. I'm taking x zero, uh, a continuous approximation of the sine function of this. Yeah, so you, you okay, you have to, it's, it's of course, I ask a little bit more and then it then can be fit on this page, but it's basically what you do, you make x zero an, a, the sine function. And then what do you have here? You just have this and you see that if this tau goes to infinity, that's the same as that tau, then I'm calculating the L1 norm of this, uh, of this Bessel function, of this weighted Bessel function. And I know that that will blow up because it's not in L1 zero infinity. So here you have your counter example. So you see that for uh, Banach spaces in general semi-groups, uh, the the answer to the inverse generator problem is is no. Yeah, uh, there are a few things. If you look at this example, then you see this is a beautiful semigroup. This this one here is a beautiful semigroup. It's a contraction semigroup. It's nilpotent, so it's exponentially stable with exponentially decay infinity. I would say yeah, it gets zero after, and even for this nice behaving semi-group, you can construct a counter example. Yeah. Now, um, and here I get to it. Before the question was posed 22 years earlier, there was already a counter example. So this was, this is Komachu paper out of 66, where he discusses fractional powers of operators. So I think that's also the, the I, okay, I think the paper is also called fractional powers. And yesterday when I prepared this, I thought, wait one moment, I have to look up that result in that paper again, yeah, because I did it years ago. And then it's a very long paper. And so it, it treats all kind of, of, of properties of these fractional powers. And then really at the end, he presents some miscellaneous results. So some results which he could also uh, uh, get out of his research. And then he constructs an, uh, and then he has an operator, which is, uh, 
which is uh, not not about not a bounded semigroup. And then at the end of this one, and then he writes, "Hey, this is interesting because the inverse generates a nice contraction semigroup." Our conference, the old. So he does not even he poses the question the other way around, which is quite funny to see. But it's somehow so. It's it's not so strange that it was overlooked because it it's somehow it's it's not at the kernel of the paper. Yeah. Now by now there are counterexamples for LP and also for little LP for every p greater than greater or equal than one. Yeah. So together with with Gomilko, definitely first with Gomilko and also with Tomilov. We constructed, uh, say, a whole class of examples that say, okay, also for these nice, say, reflexive Banach spaces, there is no hope for a positive answer. Yeah, it's only special cases, say, so some uh, like analytic semigroups, they have I a think positive we'll wait answer. Okay, so we cannot expect a positive result for Banach spaces, so we turn our attention. To, uh, to Hilbert spaces. Yeah. That's the only Banach space still open. Uh, now, then there are some very easy results right away. So if A generates a contraction semigroup and A inverse exists, then A inverse also generates a contraction semigroup. This, mm -hmm. is, just a, this is just an exercise on, on a class of when you treat contraction semigroup on Hilbert spaces, because it's not. So you know, since A generates a contraction semigroup, this holds. Now you just plug in X is A inverse, you find this. So it's only a very simple substitution and you already have the dissipativity inequality. Now then you have, of course, to have the, the, the range condition, but we already had this formula. So that really tells you that if S lies in the resolvent of A, then, oh no, A1 lies in the resolvent of A, that you know, and this tells you that one, uh, one over one, so one as well, lies in the resolvent of A inverse. So then with the Lumophilic theorem, you are directly done. So it's, 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 uh, it's no problem for, uh, for contraction semigroups. So, and then, then somehow the trouble starts, you could say, because in Hilbert spaces, you don't have that much examples which are not, say, if you, of course, if you are similar to a contraction, then it also holds, and it's just a similarity transformation. So a lot of systems or a lot of uh, generators are either similar to a contraction semigroup or they are an analytic semigroup. And for these cases, you know it's true, but of course it's not a complete cover. But for instance, if you think of an exponentially stable group, you can prove that that is similar to a contraction semigroup. So there it's also true, yeah? It's all oh, it's just, it's just. So, so I will, I will tell a result which somehow also says that, okay, that it, there is a kind of robustness in this, uh, in this question. So we had this formula and we had this transform formula. And then if you look at it, then it has to do with this J1, it has to do with the, with the Henkel transform. So if you look at it, and then if you do this transformation, so you take a continuous function with values in H, and you define this transformation. And this transformation is not precisely the Henkel transform, but it's, it's, it's related to it. Then you have this Parseval identity. Yeah, so this, this, uh, this transformation, like the Fourier transform, but also this transform, makes it, and this has really to do, so you are in a Bergman space, yeah? So the, the, the F, if F lies in a Bergman space, the, the F hat yeah, with this, this transform lies in the same space. <coughs> you have even equality of norm. And now we have this, we have, and you see and that, that this is almost, this part is the transform 
of my semi-group. But you need this condition. Otherwise, you have a problem in, in this integral, yeah? So, so no semi-group will satisfy that this holds, of course, eh? because you are in, in uh, uh, you are not zero at zero. But what is now the trick? You could do, you could take differences of semi-groups. The difference of a semi-group is always zero at zero because they always have to have the, the X zero has to be because of the identity at zero. So, and now I define something which, okay. So we have two semi-groups and they have to set, they have to have finite Bergman distance. If this, if the difference in this, uh, in this, in this one over T measure is finite and the squared difference and the same holds also for the adjoints. Yeah, then they are, then they have finite Bergman distance. Then I say they have finite Bergman distance. And now we come to this. Now there is a nice lemma, which is not that hard to prove, but if you have two semi-groups which have a finite Bergman distance, then the one is bounded even only if the other one is bounded. And if you just think about it, it's just in this one over T weight here. Huh? If you just think of an exponential, yeah, wait one moment, if I have a to the power a t, when can I subtract something such that this whole, in so I have to subtract an exponential such that this integral is exists, yeah? Now, if, if a is negative, then it goes very fast to zero, so the other exponential here also has to go fast to zero. Could not stay on the imaginary x, then this then this this one over t will not do it. Yeah. But this is nice, and that's why you also need and the dual to have these these two things. But if they have a finite Bergman distance, then the one is bounded even only if the other one is bounded. Now with this we can prove a perturbation result. So let's I have two semi-groups. T and S with generator A, oh, with, uh, with generator A and A tilde. Yeah. And now, if this theorem, so if they both generate bounded semigroup and they have a finite Bergman distance, yeah, then if one of them has a bounded C0 semigroup, so has the other one. So if for a, the inverse generator uh, question is true, then, the, then that's also true for A tilde. So if you have two semigroups which are close in this distance, and one has, say, the inverse generator question true, then the same holds for the other one. So this is a kind of, of robustness you can see, eh? a kind of, and I will say, make it more explicitly, Okay, this is just the proof. You just have, you, this is just the whole the proof. You, you just have this equality because of the transformation. And since this is finite, if one is bounded, so must be the other one. But maybe more importantly, I'm also seeing, yeah, our time goes perfectly. I, uh, it's a nice application. Let's see that I get a nice application here. Yeah? Let A generate an exponentially stable contraction semigroup and let Q be bounded. Then, mm, okay. And I assume, of course, that A plus Q still generates an exponentially stable semigroup. Yeah. Then A plus Q inverse will also generate a bounded semigroup, will generate a bounded semigroup. Yeah, so you have basically, let's make a picture. No, I don't know. I don't need to, to, need to have a cross here. But I have here somewhere A, which is exponentially stable, which generates an exponentially stable contraction semi-group. And I have here somewhere my Q. Yeah, so A plus Q. Then 
and they are so close and that a plus q still generates a exponentially stable semigroup then this one if a then then uh, then this distance being finite it means and that this also generates an, the inverse also generates an exponentially stable semigroup and what you just have to check is that this is finite between the two semigroups now infinity is not a problem because they are both exponentially stable so they go very exponentially fast and then zero you just have to play and there is in that q is bounded and now i know that because a generates a contraction semigroup a inverse is also a generator of a semigroup and then the theorem tells you that the a plus q inverse also generates a bounded semigroup so i want to i want to end yeah nice yeah i want to end with uh with a relation to another problem and to another field so the other the the other field is numerical analysis and the other problem is somehow the co-generator problem. So, okay, if you if you have this uh, say abstract ODE, then one way to approximate it is by taking. Okay, here you see already somehow the the no your student idea of a derivative. Huh? No mistake. And this is now funny. You don't put here z or the x evaluated at n h, but you take a local average so here you take a local average if you rewrite this in an equation for the because you have both have so, so let's let's be i replace i replace x n h that is in my case is the z n yeah that you just replace by z n there's the z n coming from and now you see here is z n plus one and here is z n plus one so I bring these things to the other side, you rewrite everything, and you get this equation that the set n plus one is this uh, operator times the, almost its inverse times the set n. And this, this I call AD. This I call AD. The discrete A, you could say. Discretized version of the A. Now, one remark that this if you take h is two, then this is just the Cayley transform of a. You could also say, no, this is the Cayley transform of h, a divided by two. Yeah, it's just the same thing. So you see that with this, this numerical trick, you get to the Cayley transform. And of course, an interesting question is, if my, if my solutions to this ordinary differential equations are bounded, so that means that the semigroup is bounded, are then the solutions to this equation also bounded? And that means precisely that AD is power bounded, that the powers of AD are uniformly bounded. So now again, and that's also very old, that if you have A uh, generates a contraction semigroup, then the power, then the AD is also a contraction. So a discrete contraction, yeah. So this, this also holds, and then also the powers are always less than one. So this brings you to the very interesting question. If A generates a bounded semigroup on H, is AD power bounded? No. And then this question, you could think why, okay, numerical people only work with matrices, which are very large, but they work with matrices. Why is this question then interesting? Now, then you have to bring the dimension in. Then, then the, the answer is, is clearly that you can prove by just looking at the eigenvalues that this answer to this question is yes. But then you ask yourself, is the bound independent of the dimension? Can I find a universal constant? And of course, it's, it's because these... In numerical analysis, these matrices get bigger and bigger. It's good to have constants which are then on independent of this dimension. Uh, and then we have the following result. If A and A inverse both generate a bounded semigroup, 
then AD is power bounded. And we get this estimate even. And now the funny thing about this, yeah? This was proven by, by, by three independent researchers. Um, uh, the first one, Asisov, Barbusov, Bar and Dijksma, and they published it in 2004. Gomilko also published it in 2004, and I published it with Guo in 2006. Okay. It was really independent because I still remember that we proved it and that it was already in 2001. It was just before 9-11. Before That's why I remember it. Yeah, but it's not. Um, but the funny thing, because Dijksma, that's a, he was one of my professors in Groningen. So I think, I don't know precisely how I got to know this, but I, I discussed it later with him because this paper is again like, like this paper of Gomachu is going completely on something else. They are talking about crime spaces. And then there is a last section where they just prove this result. And I asked him at Dijksma, what, what is the story? And he said, yeah, if I remember correctly, yeah, just, just, okay, this is recorded. So now I should be very careful, yeah. But I, what I remember is that he told me that as he saw, had proved this result and would like to have that in the paper and the co-authors agreed, yeah? But it was really somehow like Kumachio, yeah, we also have this result, very interesting. And of course, it's a very interesting result, yeah? It's a very nice result. Um, and also, okay. Um, yeah, the estimate, I also had a kind, I think in this estimate and goes back to Felix Wenninger, yeah? That, that he has that in his thesis. And I think I, I he, he likes to have very sharp estimates. So here you see a relation between the inverse generator problem in, in somehow this problem in, in numerics, yeah? Um, okay, these are closing remarks and it's perfectly, I don't know how much time I still have, but I thought I, I, I planned my talk for three quarters of an hour and I perfectly did somehow, yeah? Seven, seven minutes left. Oh, I still have time. Okay, then I don't know what I have to say all the time. Yeah? Now I followed this, if you want to read it back, this is somehow I followed very closely uh, already an old paper of mine. But there is a very nice overview where you find a lot of these results by Alexander. And there is a natural relation and that I also, I want to make already an advertisement for the next talk because there is somehow a, a natural relation with bounded functional calculus. Yeah, because you, 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 you see already and what I had as the inverse, the inverse semi-group was already this, this, this kernel representation of, of the original semi-group. And that is already that you could see as the start of a, func of a functional calculus. So uh, there was also in a very recent paper just in February put on archive by Bati, Gomilko, and Tomilov. Yeah, there was also, they, they also discussed there the, the relation. This was uh, what I had prepared. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Hans, for this very inspiring and very clear talk.